Hi, I am with Thomas Tyke, President and CEO of Direct Relief, and we are at their warehouse here in Santa Barbara. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you for coming. Yeah, definitely. There are so many questions that we would like to ask you and your organization, but let's just start with the history. How the uh, Direct Relief started here in Santa Barbara? Well, it was founded by two men who were war immigrants in, after World War II, made their way here, fled the Nazi occupation and destruction of Europe, and ended up here in Santa Barbara with some personal wealth intact. So the history of Direct Relief was originally a family foundation started by William Zimden, whose money founded it, with his colleague, Dennis Karzag, who ended up uh, growing the organization over 50 years. Now, what's the mission nowadays? I know it has moved through time, right? Yeah, it's basically how it started, to make sure that people who find themselves in vulnerable situations, either because of a wartime situation or just chronic poverty, can get medical care that otherwise wouldn't be available. It's still a chronic challenge in the world that people who are poor mm -hmm. uh, often don't get the care that they need because they can't pay for it, their governments can't pay for it, or there's no social service safety net. So that's why nonprofits exist generally, and what Direct Relief has been able to do extensively for the past 61 years. Now, this building is huge. You have a lot of, why don't we go and walk sure. a little bit, items that you have here, mostly <laughs> medical, right? Almost exclusively medical. Um, the, the entire warehouse we have mm -hmm. here and across the street, there's over 50,000 square feet of warehousing that contains all sorts of prescription medications because we're a licensed pharmacy mm -hmm. wholesaler, and as well as supplies and surgical instruments and the things that can equip a basic health facility Sometimes we stay away from the very sophisticated equipment because of some of the challenges of maintaining it, mm -hmm. but really we're trying to strengthen the primary care services available to people in emergencies and also just in areas of poverty. So tell me, how do you get funded? Well, we're entirely privately funded. So mm -hmm. all, we don't have any government support or contracts, so it all comes from private individuals, businesses, foundations, um, and that's been that way for a long time. So. You know, we're, it's a constant challenge to stay in touch with people, find people who might be interested in supporting our work, and also through our website, people make contributions. Google has been a tremendous supporter of ours mm -hmm. from a corporate side, gave us an aggressive or sophisticated online presence so people could find us through the different search engines that exist, or primarily Google, and that has just been a tremendous boost to our organization to raise the funds necessary to pay for all the work involved with uh, not only getting the material in but getting it out and identifying the people who can put it to good use. So uh, it's an ongoing challenge as it is for many organizations to do it, but we've been fortunate to have great supporters and a great board of directors who really lead that charge each year. Now I have a question about um, like choosing where you will be lending your help because there are so many people in need. How, how do right. you decide? Well, it's a good question. And what we always do is uh, we have a a methodology that tries to identify the areas of greatest need. And for us, it's really important that we identify people who, who work there, who are committed, live in the communities, and we're a support organization for them. We know from long experience that people, even after emergencies, or even in high need areas, have deeply committed people, but they're so busy taking care of mm -hmm. pursuing their mission, they don't raise funds in the U.S. They don't have access to the types of resources we do. Mm -hmm. So a big part of what we do is try to uh, identify and qualify and select great committed people. And they are all over the world. They're just off the screen of visibility. So we're, we have a good network of people that we work with. And we really are guided by their capacity to care for the people under their, you know, the, in their projects. And but all things equal, we really go to the areas of greatest need, wherever it is in the world. Now, how do you organize your team for an emergency call? Because I know you cover a lot of tragedies. Right. You know, it's, it's often the same thing that we do on a good day. Who's, who's there? Who are the best local players? Uh, the actors who have the best information, can do the best work. And we try to identify those people who are well-placed to advise us. One of the worst things you can do in emergencies is just take whatever you think they need and bring it in because it can get in the way of something that actually is needed. So mm -hmm. we really key off of the judgment of the people that we know. Often we just work with the same people we were already working with before. They're, like in Santa Barbara, if there's <laughs> emergency, you'd really want to make sure you're keying off Cottage Hospital and the people who do it every day and know the community. We do the same thing here in Santa Barbara. We also do the same thing wherever the emergencies exist in the world. That's good. I was going to ask you about local efforts. Mm -hmm. What have you done lately for the Santa Barbara community? 
Well, we work very closely with the uh, Office of Emergency Services and Public Health to make sure that if an emergency occurs here in Santa Barbara, that they have access to the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. We have a formal written agreement with the county uh, so that they can avail themselves of our resources. We work very closely on planning. We actually uh, warehouse some of the materials for them. Again, as is anywhere in the world, we want to play a supportive role to the local officials mm -hmm. who are going to be doing all the work if an emergency happens. The Gap Fire, the T Fire, we had the particulate masks that were very important uh, for people with breathing complications. Mm -hmm. We had, I think, the largest inventory in California at the time, so we made those available to local residents. Now, tell me a little bit more about your staff. Mm -hmm. Like, how many volunteers do you have or people working full-time? Well, we have uh, just under 50 full-time employees uh, on staff, mm -hmm. and we have hundreds of volunteers of all ages and with all different skills who come in every week. Uh, oh, really? We really couldn't function <laughs> as well as we do without incredibly talented volunteer labor. Some of it works in the warehouse doing physical labor and packing, inventorying. Some of it is kind of the licking and stamping and trying to communicate with donors. We have researchers, students who come over as interns from UCSB, grade school programs who come in and do some picking and packing to do dental kits for local residents who are low income and some of the training associated with that. Mm -hmm. So from it's everyone. hundreds of volunteers who come through Direct Relief each year and we love them. It's a fun place uh, for us. It makes it more interesting since we have to work with each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And it just allows us to do a lot more with the, the limited resources we have. Well, thank you very much. And lastly, can you give us the website where people can get more information? I can. It's directrelief.org. And our phone number is 964-4767. Thank you, Thomas, for this interview. Thank you. My pleasure. For more information on the Nonprofit Spotlight, check our website at www.spchannels.tv or call 963-3893. If you'd like your nonprofit featured in a future nonprofit spotlight, contact us at the information on your screen.